We continue our summit with the first panel discussion under the title of The Role of Alterna Alternative Architecture Education Platforms, moderated by Lukas Feireis. I would like to introduce Lukas with a photograph, of course. Lucas has been a visiting professor <coughs> at the University of Art and Design in Linz, where he taught about space and design strategies. Lucas' work focuses on the dialogue between architecture, art, and visual culture in the urban realm. He runs the interdisciplinary creative practice studio Lucas Feireis in Berlin, which encompasses a broad range of artistic cur curational, editorial, and consultative work. He teaches at various universities worldwide, specializing in visual culture. Among others, Lucas developed and conceptualized the Space Meta Symposium at the University of Art and Design in Linz last year in Austria. And currently, he uh, conceptualizes a social, the, 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 the symposium called Social Design Public Action in Vienna at the end of this month. Lucas, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Dietmar, for the invitation and the introduction. Um, so I will be your host for the next hour and a half. I will try to keep in timing as well. I'm honored and delighted uh, to be the moderator for this first panel on the role of alternative architectural educational platforms uh, at this year's Architectural Education, Architecture Education Summit here in Berlin. Um, I would like to thank a lot of people. I would like to thank Hitoshi and Martha. I would like to thank Hans-Jürgen and Christine, Dietmar, Dunja, Joana, and the entire AEDIS crew um, for this event and for inviting me here. And I would like to uh, thank the participants of the 10 by 10 sessions um, for the actually incredible brainstorm and, and topical warm-up that we've experienced over the last hours. And after this very inspiring and very eclectic tour de force of visions for possible futures of architecture education, the room is, or the roof's kind of already on fire. But like finding answers to all the questions raised in the last couple of hours alone will keep us busy for 10 years, easy, no? Um, nonetheless, I'm sure that we, my illustrious group of speakers and panelists and me, myself, will keep you um, entertained and edutained and provide you in the following while discussing the possibilities of new models um, and directions for alternative architecture education with even more questions, hopefully rather than answers. And as the saying goes, only a very ignorant man uh, answers every question he is asked. So let's get into the subject um, of uh, our panel. Um, today, numerous universities, limited simply by the inherent inflexi inflexibility of any large institutionalized structure or system, all too often do not seem to be able to proactively respond in their curri curriculum or with their teaching methods to very acute and pressing demands, whether they are architectural or of, uh, whether they are of architectural or sociocultural or political or environmental uh, nature, and seem at times slow of the mark. Um, and beyond the often restricted or even restrictive protocol of institu institutionalized academic programs, independent pedagogical platforms, on the other hand, seem to promise at least novel ways of cross-thinking that expand the role of the architect and designer at the very basis of, of educational values in order to function more broadly and maybe more imaginatively as spatial agents within today's very complex global realities in both, and that's important, theory and practice. To now um, critically discuss and reflect upon this matter with such a renowned and in every sense mixed group of panelists um, will hopefully be of great interest to all of us here. And I would like to start by introducing the panelists one by one um, and afterwards invite them to give a very short five minute motivational yeah, speech is exaggerated statement. <laughs> so the, the, the people in the first group, they can be lucky, they had 10. You only have five now. 
So I would like to start with Eugene S. Uh, he's founder and dean of March, the Moscow Architecture School, a new independent school of architecture in Russia's capital city that is born as, quote, a reaction to the monopolization of architecture education in Russia and the lack of critical thinking, um, in particular about building development in Moscow. It's located on the grounds uh, of the cultural and design hub Art Play. Uh, March provides in direct partnership with the London Metropolitan University a two-year graduate program certified by LMU for Russian as well as foreign students. Next up in our lineup is Jono Bennett um, from Johannesburg, uh, South Africa, trained as an architect. He's co-founder of One to One Agency of Engagement. Uh, and as an agency, One to One aims to provide um, additional values, basically, and methodologies for effectively operating as an architect in the country's development uh, sector by working very closely or engaging, as the title says, one-on-one -on -one with the respective local conditions and communities. Third person is Tatjana Schneider. She is a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield in England and co-author and re researcher of spatial agency. Tatjana's research uh, centers on the social and political context of architecture and how space is produced and used with a particular focus on an, let's say, expanded understanding of the role of the architect. Spatial agency, a discursive platform or online archive she founded together with Jeremy Till is a project that suggests other ways of doing architecture that are often neglected in the discourse of architectural education. And last but not least, Mark Wigley, the Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University in New York since 2004. In his role as Dean at Columbia, Mark Wigley has overseen the development of a number of labs, laboratories to serve as an interface between the school and the rest of the world where a new kind of experimentation takes place and a new kind of thinking about architecture takes place. Wigley is also the curator and editor of uh, numerous exhibitions and books and co-founder of the Volume magazine with Ram Kolas and Ole Baumann. I would like to now invite the first uh, panelist, Eugene, to the stage. And uh, I have to be as strict as Dietmar about the timing, so it's five minutes, and I say one minute when one minute is left. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a great honor to, to stay in front of such an audience. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would say that slides are not directly connected to my speech, so it just will be, you know, just a row of images. Uh, okay, so uh, as you already know, I'm, I'm from Russia. And I'm afraid that most of you have no idea about current Russian architecture. I would bet that you won't recall a single internationally recognized contemporary Russian architect or a single project designed by a Russian in the last 20 years. Uh, of course, I would be happy to lose. It's the same with architectural education. There is no line of foreign applicants trying to win acceptance to Russian schools of architecture. After decades of Soviet isolation from the world, Russia will remain, uh, still remain on the sideline, sidelines of international architectural discourse. Nothing in 20 post-Soviet years changed our country's plight. Architectural education in my country is highly centralized with a center in Moscow Architecture Institute, MARHI, highly standardized, and those standards are totally obsolete and painfully rigid. This is, uh, this is the context in which we have launched a new architectural school in Moscow, March, and I'm uh, its founder and dean. March is the first and today the only independent institution of higher education in Russia to offer a postgraduate degree in architecture and urban design. March is validated by London Metropolitan University. Our students are registered as London Met students and will be awarded Masters of Architecture and Urbanism degrees. We are closely related to the CAS Faculty of Arts and Architecture of London Met. Our modules are linked to the London program, but adapted to local conditions and tied to our vision of education. 
March began a year ago with just 36 students. This year, we plan to open spaces for 48 additional students. In the future, March will have about 100 students. Uh, March is integrated into the multidisciplinary educational consortium of the British Higher School of Design in Moscow, along with schools of arts, industrial design, graphics design, fashion, interior design, filmmaking, and others. All the schools, including March, are located in the very exciting, brutal industrial area transformed in creative hub known as Art Play. The name March is translation of the Russian abbreviation of our more formal name, Moskovskaya Architekturna Eskola, or Marsh. In very word Marsh, the very word Marsh is emblematic of our teaching and what we stand for, dynamic, courageous, vigorous, and it, it is a reminder of spring, of all things new, and after all, it's simply master of architecture. Our mission in founding this new school is to redesign architecture education in the country. We intend to be a catalyst for change in the entire Russian architectural scene, which certainly needs radical transformations. We are going to do this by growing the uh, the leaders of the new generation of architects who can provide this transformation. I suppose that the main problem of architectural school in Russia, and maybe not only there, is the dramatic gap between education and reality. Education proceeds within a, so to say, professional reality, re reality of positive knowledge, technical drawings, glossy photos, and finally a collection of professional cliches. Professional reality has little in common with the reality of sensual experience, with materiality of live environments, with real social, political, economical, and cultural contexts. Students hardly imagine what the contemporary professional practice looks like. Living underneath the tyranny of images, they are dramatically disconnected to the real world. Our school is marching to reality. Our course encourages students to dive deep into actual physical, social, cultural, economical, and political realities. We put, uh, sorry, okay. We put in the center of our curriculum cultural and humanitarian discourse. Our cons we consider our education not the production of alternative forms and training solo geniuses, but as training sensitive, intelligent, and responsible professionals capable of navigating the complicated conditions of the contemporary world. No single methods achieve such a goal, so we see alternative education as the continuous experiments with teaching methods and curriculum. Okay, so to be short, uh, this year we, we offer uh, a cross-unit program with London math students under the direction of guest professor Peter Markley of Zurich and Alexander Brodsky, maybe one, and the only international known Russian architect. And students will make comparative analysis of industrial areas in London and Moscow and will give design proposal for their renewal. We would like to see March become the platform for actual architectural and urban debates in Russia. We would like to see our school become the vehicle for incorporating Russia into international discourse. We have many plans and programs and projects, and we face a lot of problems, of course, and we hope to find, to find support and coordination, collaboration with our colleagues from the internationally recognized leading schools presenting, presented in this room. Thank you. Okay. So, back there? Yes, back there. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the timing is not mine. I feel that it's now it's like five minutes, but nevertheless, uh, it's ten minutes and five minutes now. Um, the next one up, please, is Jono Bennett <laughs> with another five minutes. But, you know, we keep a certain kind of energy with this uh, timing. Hi. <clears throat> Next year, <clears throat> excuse me, all well, this pressure on this five minutes has put a bit of a hold here. 2014. 2014 will mark the 20 year period that South Africa has been a democratically free country since apartheid ended in April 1994. According to our government, one of the most enduring legacies of the apartheid are the spatial inequalities that over 50 years of legalized racial segregation established and that as a country are being tangibly addressed through various redevelopment strategies. At the core of the redevelopment is the promise made by the new government of South Africa to offer free housing to its most economically vulnerable citizens. 
So far, the government has managed to deliver over 2.3 million houses, but unfortunately, it's sitting with a housing backlog that is bigger now than it was in 1994. Within the rehousing scheme, we currently have over 1.7 million shack homes in informal settlements, made up of an estimated 5.6 million people in poor and unsafe living conditions across South Africa. The South African Department of Human Settlements has initiated an institutionalized mechanism to address these issues, the National Upgrade Support Program. We have recently began a series of projects to meet the National Development Plan's Outcome 8, which is to upgrade 400,000 well-located and formal homes by 2014, a target that they won't meet. The ethos of which is regarded to be participatory, engage local communities, and it <clears throat> Excuse me, and facilitate the implementation of national policy through local government and residents. Of the professionals directly involved in this process, including engineers, planners, building professionals, architects in South Africa are not considered by the implementers of this initiative to be relevant or effective and were not consulted during the process of the development of the outcomes or its strategies. One of the various factors for this, and the most evident, is that over a seven-year architectural degree, Less than 10% of the courses engage, expose, or in design modules deal with issues around informality. For now, the architectural academia in South Africa merely opens the door to these contexts and do not offer ongoing or acute support to develop ways of interpreting these complex spaces, let alone designing for them, instead focusing on traditional roles for architects. As students, we were lucky enough in 2010 to be offered such an opportunity in Johannesburg, Soweto, to work within a formal settlement. The settlement is highly organized and supported by a grassroots community-based organization that falls under the Shack Dwellers International Alliance. After a six-week participatory research and theoretical design process, the leadership requested that we continue working with them beyond the university course. After much bargaining with our professors and academic staff and a series of chance events, we were allowed to build part of what we had designed for our studio course, as long as the community and us as students could fund and build it within eight weeks. We identified the greatest need during our process to be that of a community hall, sacrificing our architectural ideas and our theoretical design processes. We then spent the next eight weeks designing with the local residents, building and funding on site, and ultimately changing how we thought, how we acted, and how we were effective as architects. These lessons were crucial the following year when we as students critically challenged the role of architecture and development practice through our master's dissertations. In 2012, I was offered the opportunity to take students through the same process we underwent in 2010 by the University of Pretoria. Here I assisted in exposing the students to a process of critical engagement with and for the community of Slovo Park. The aim being to take them through a journey of cultural immersion that would unlearn their preconceived notions they brought as middle class economic South Africans and, through, <clears throat> and then outside of the university, through a design build process, where they added to the structure we had built in 2010. During this project, we decided to establish the one-to-one -one student league. The idea behind the student league was to create a platform for the students to be able to exercise their tools and skills as spatial designers within four communities of developing settlements. These experiences are documented, shared, and aimed at capacitating not only the students, but also the communities involved. Later that year, I took up a dual position between the University of Johannesburg and the Shack Dwellers International Alliance. Here I assisted with the informal studio supported by 2610 South Architects and the Goethe Institute. This took place in the informally squatted warehouses of Marlborough South in Johannesburg's Alexandra Township. Here I played the role between NGO, CBO, and the community. The crucial points were the pre-process steps we took to develop the architectural brief to suit the community group based on the development and advocacy needs, while satisfying the university requirements of an academic process, while maintaining the ethos and practices of the NGO. During the middle of this course, the city began a wide-scale and later deemed a legal eviction of parts of the settlement that threw an even deeper complexity into our process and our role there as architects. I've recently stepped out of the Shack Dwellers International Alliance and have begun focusing more on one-to-one -one as an agency of engagement that through practicing socio-technical projects and bringing students, young professionals, and key technically skilled community members together as a means beyond redevelopment. Our hope is to expose these practitioners and residents to the complexity of this field, 
while creating the precedent of engagement and eventually develop this into an established additional mode of practice that is recognized and respected by governments, NGOs, and effective for communities <clears throat> in need of, it, of for their development processes. Thank you. We're getting better and better. Um, with the timing, Tatiana, please, next one. straight in. Uh, so um, let's just simply face it, um, architecture might be highly relevant um, to um, society, but as it is taught, practiced, and written about, it um, has almost um, become uh, irrelevant. Schools of architecture continue to portray uh, and teach 600-year-old values. The concept of architecture and the modern architect formulated by Alberti in 1452 um, is still with us um, today. Uh, what did Alberti do? He um, invented authorship. He separated the builder from the architect. He severed the process of production from the process of design. He separated doing from drawing. Architecture in this um, context became a merely intellectual exercise. And over the years, architecture became increasingly limited to design. Spatial agency, the project I'm talking to about today, um, shakes um, this up, but not only that, it's, it's a little bit more than that. It's um, a research project um, and that started um, uh, to investigate alternative architectural practices um, at the University of Sheffield in England um, and describes other ways of doing architecture beyond the focus on building. It, it, it describes a form of um, not just architectural but um, spatial praxis um, that is ethical as much as it is socially transformative. A praxis that is motivated by radical, ecological, political, pedagogical and professional agendas um, which explicitly addresses unjust development, inequality, and also exploitation. It doesn't shy away from difficult decisions um, and discussions. And it's quite easy to see what it means um, for the practice of architectural spatial design more generally. Um, and I will quickly go over this. Um, when traditional education is um, uh, and practice worships the single, often male, heroes, uh, spatial agency is concerned with collaborative production. When our traditional um, education is, con is concerned with the object, spatial agency is about the subjects of architecture. When traditional education is about a neat, um, pristine drawings, spatial agency is about what the drawings are about, um, the expression of social relationships in uh, through physical matter. Uh, when what is typically valued is the measurable, the quantifiable stuff, spatial agency values that, but also the soft, the tacit, the intangible. Spatial agency values not singular truth, but um, a multitude of knowledges. It's about scale, but not in a geographical um, sense, but as an attribute to justice. Spatial agency values the dynamic and fluid over the static and still. It's not about abstract space, but lived in space. And it moves away from traditional dichotomies. Um, there is no um, uh, teacher-student relationship, but there's a sense of mutual co-learning. It uh, follows the principles of critical pedagogy, um, Paolo Freire, Peter McLaren, and so on. It moves away from designing for to designing with. It's neither about the global nor the local, but about an interdependency of scales, and why this um, is a long list. You might sit here and say, well, what are you actually talking about? What, what does um, spatial agency do? Why would we actually need this? Um, I would say that architecture so far has failed uh, to respond to any of the big problems um, like climate change, population growth, exploitation, uneven development, and so on. And of course, architecture is not the only force in this dilemma. Um, and we could also say that it's not for architects to deal with these issues. Let politicians, industrialists, and so on do this. We as architects, we can't really do anything about this anyway. So we continue to, um, to um, uh, sit there and um, fiddle, fiddle uh, while the world burns. Um, we fiddle with form. Uh, technology and discourse, we are preoccupied with our relationship to the professional bodies and so on. I, I think you get the gist. 
I would argue that most architectural education happens in this bubble. We use our, in inverted commas, um, proven incapacity to contribute meaningfully uh, to society as an ongoing excuse for non-engagement with the world. When it comes to education, we use frameworks provided by others. In the UK, it's the RBA as an excuse not to change the curriculum. So it's actually um, business as usual, education as usual. Um, and there are, of course, a lot of damning uh, reports and books that unpick this system. Despite this, um, there have been very few attempts to propose wholesale revisions to the um, structures and methods of architectural education. And um, whilst I wouldn't say that um, spatial agency is the wholesale revision that is needed and that we've been searching um, for, um, for so long. It poses some difficult questions about how students of architecture are educated and whom and what for. Whom do we serve as students and as architects? Architectural education, as much um, as architectural practice, is about taking positions. Uh, just like plaque lines um, on a white piece of paper, architectural education is not neutral. If we like, um, if we go on like we are at the moment, architecture schools might become obsolete very quickly. Um, of course, there will always be the niche market, um, but um, that might be it. So spatial agency is clearly a critique of the system that architecture practice and education operates in. And um, this includes um, the big elephant in the room, uh, capitalism and architecture's complicity with it. However, I would not describe spatial agency as an alternative uh, to the current system. Acknowledging that we've been talking about uh, before provides a radically different perspective on the field of operation for architects and spatial designers. It's about, um, in the words of um, Cedric Price, not the design of bridges, but how to get to the other side, but it's also um, much more um, uh, towards a different perspective uh, that is about working with others to achieve social and spatial justice. Now you, Mark, please. Thanks for this inflammatory statement from you, Tatiana. Okay, that's my slide. Um, <laughs> I was really thrilled to be in this panel, the role of alternative architectural education platforms, because uh, so many beautiful colleagues are here saying incredible things, so the only problem is, where are you gonna be placed? And to be placed in the alternative pile, I think is really good, because nobody quite knows what it means, and also that's why you use the word alternative, like alternative music is music outside of the classification, so I like to hide in there. And I like the sentence, so I just wanna look at very quickly at the words in the sentence, starting with education, then platform, then alternative, then architecture, starting with education. Uh, the great trick about education is, of course, it's precisely the purpose of education is what happens afterwards. So it's a very bizarre form of behavior which is devoted to, concentrated on, uh, not what's happening, but what might happen in the future. So this, this is especially doubled in the case of an architecture school where what it's imagined might happen in the future is people imagining the future. So it's a kind of double school, a school inside a school. Uh, and of course, the way we tend to think about the relationship between what happens in the school and what happens afterwards is in terms of uh, academic on the inside, professional on the outside, laboratory on the inside, field on the outside, experimental, normative, these kinds of things. So you're in training and then you, as it were, do it. N none of those uh, are, can survive very long in, a, in five, even a five minute conversation. Uh, in fact, the whole uh, um, thought that education comes first and practice comes second is gone. It's out, uh, it, totally inadequate. If you think about it, our sense of what is the inside of the school is always reinforced, usually by, by architecture, by, by solid walls, very solid walls. Um, but it's precisely because what the limits of a school of architecture actually are is super unclear that we have very clear walls. In fact, I would suggest to you that's what solid walls are. Solid walls are mark doubt, radical doubt. They only need to be solid and they only need to be walls because we are not sure and we are unsure. So you place the wall, you place even your city and every definition and division of the city in the, in the areas of maximum doubt. So the walls of a school confidently locate 
what we don't know, what, what, what we are unsure of. And if you look at any school, of course, schools have many borders, many boundaries, and many different ways of crossing. Schools are a kind of ecology of borders, a kind of layering of borders, and a layering of strategies of crossing those borders. Almost exactly 10 years ago, I wrote a manifesto called Towards a Perforated School, and then I then tried to um, put that into action. And that was based on the idea that precisely if the wall marks doubt, and if actually education is all about maturing doubt, then actually the walls are quite useful, but the wall is, as it were, an engine. Uh, if it's perforated, then there's a kind of breathing. So it's not really about the difference between the inside and the outside. In fact, when you breathe, what you do is confuse the inside and the outside. You bring the outside to the inside, then you release the inside uh, out. And education might be, therefore, a kind of a breathing. So this means education not as a kind of bracketing off from the world, which is the classic under understanding of the school, that you take time out, to think and reflect and to re-energize, take steroids and then return uh, 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 to the world uh, as it were supercharged. But instead you could see uh, the border not as a bracketing off but as a productive engine, uh, uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, me mechanism. After all, I don't think it's the case that we have as it were a world and then you can bracket off schools in that world as sort of isolated sanctuaries of, re, of reflection. You could say that there's no such thing as a world without a school, that schools are, as it were, world production machines. They are places in which uh, the world is literally uh, uh, invented. And to say it most obviously, and you didn't need me to say this, schools are literally everywhere. There is no, as it were, non-school uh, 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 terrain. So on the second word, platform. Platform sounds great, sounds so virtuous. And it's so architectural, right? The platform. So platform is, is therefore, good, good, good. So platform is, is a horizontal plane lifted up, but has no definition. So in theory allows anything uh, uh, to happen. But of course, as architects, we know perfectly when you lift up, you have created a wall of, of massive uh, 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 proportions. Of course, the idea of the platform is the idea of a kind of generosity. I'll make a platform for you. I will, but it means also, I will be underneath you. It means if I am not there, you will fall. Right? So the provider of the platform, I provide a platform, has this kind of a, a, a patronizing uh, 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 tone. What if we could think of the inverse of a platform, a kind of lowering uh, uh, think of a school not as, an, a, as a platform or as providing platforms, but as a kind of embedding or uh, uh, lowering it, which gets us quickly to the word alternative. Alternative, of course, means precisely not a bracketing off. Alternative is a parallel universe. It's an alternative path. It's, it's a path, precisely. So here you could think about education not as, a, not as a bracketing off, but as a kind of parallel journey, which is more or less continuous and indeed could be uh, uh, understood to be one of many, many and multiple journeys. Education itself, therefore, as an alternative path, not necessarily linked to a school as such. In other words, it's the, pr it's the production of the sense of alternative. And so if, if you think of it the other way around, that education is, as it were, the production uh, uh, of alternative paths, and those paths are, are only alternative paths in as, in as much as they seem to go forever uh, 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 into the, into the so-called future, then I think you have the beginning of a kind of mechanism. And, and um, um, much as I hate the sort of Swiss idea of neutrality, since there seems to be that the Swiss are the least neutral beings on planet Earth, um, nevertheless, something, something like neutrality could be placed in, in, in the, in the could, could be used to replace the word platform. Maybe by, by neutrality, I mean naivety. And I think, for example, uh, 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 it's very, very hard to be naive inside architecture schools. Uh, they, are, they are like machines. If the university is a stupidity reduction machine, which is, in fact, its purpose, schools of architecture are places where people are very smart. Uh, and, and this lack of naivety, or this illusion of lack of naivety, seems to me an enormous danger to education. And I think what's so positive about most of the stuff I've heard about so far today is there is a kind of naivety to it. That is to say, uh, people are embedding uh, scenes of interaction somewhat naively uh, uh, in situations about which they don't have knowledge. And that, so it really is a profound inversion of the idea that knowledge is generated inside a school and then, as it were, applied into the world. And I think a kind of uh, strategic naivety is incredibly valuable. If you're coming from New Zealand, it's not strategic at all. It's real. Um, you simply don't know what's going on. You've been trained your whole life to believe that real things are going on up north. Um, and uh, so it's a, as a fully-fledged representative of the naivety uh, uh, group uh, that I'm here today, and I, I will stop.
Um, I will try to evolve our discussion um, around four thematic clusters that at all points interweave and interconnect. I would like to talk to you about the problem with the status quo, about the inflexibility of institu institutionalization, about the rediscovery of the collective, uh, the intersectional possibilities of architecture, and the surplus of the architectural model. So um, let's start this discourse on a common level and with a very general observation. We just heard statements from very diverse backgrounds of experiences, ranging A, from an alternative architecture school in a, let's say, predominantly conservative uh, Moscow, to a very hands-on approach of social design and development via community involvement in uh, South Africa, to um, a very in, inflammatory statement um, for a spatial agency, in, in here in this case, in, uh, for the dissemination of a non-standard experimental critical spatial practice, as well as um, a great summary of actually what, what we're discussing here today and, uh, um, and the, the possibilities that an architecture school offers to you, Mark. So despite the local and the cultural circumstances against all of your positions must be understood, to me all of the aforementioned positions have, very simply speaking, in common that they all try to deliberately and actively question the status quo of the architectural profession. Now to me it seems that this is a very tricky thing with questioning the status quo in the context in particular of pedagogical strategies. Because, we heard this before, any institutionalized curriculum, someone needs a uh, accredited definition, a history, a set of assumption as an educational point of departure. Beatrice Colomina called it before, she said pedagogic Thank you. Um, implies always a system, and this is the case. So um, at the same time, there is always a, uh, the dire need to push the envelope, no, and and to look further for contemporary or even future solutions. But then, even questioning the given, no, the, the status quo, bears, uh, bears the danger of only establishing a new status quo. So the status quo, as well as its current challenges, are always transitory, temporary. So how can we avoid being caught in such a catch-22 situation? No, it's, it's a dialectical dilemma that we're facing. Mark, maybe I can start with you. Um, you have served prior to your deanship at Columbia's Univer Columbia University for almost 10 years as the director of graduate studies at Princeton University. Now having headed two of the most renowned Ivy League architectural schools and being responsible for successfully upbringing generations of architects um, over, uh, yeah, over close to, to three decades, how did you deal with this paradoxical situation or this, this dialectical conflict? How did you manage to bridge the gap between the status quo ante and the status quo, between the given and the becoming, between the past, present, and future as an educator? Well, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, number one, I, I wasn't director of graduate studies for 10 years. I think for a couple of years I did that. And uh, I wouldn't wish that job on anyone. It's a kind of administrative uh, nightmare. So you, you could have said, why did you allow yourself, uh, number one, to spend two years as director of graduate studies? And even worse, how did you allow yourself to be a dean? I, I, think, I think that, and I don't, don't feel very successful, I, I think that... Um, for me personally, the politics are, are more easily formulated, which is I think the status quo is never what it says it is. So for me, the most subversive work I in fact involves going inside and locating within the logic of what you believe to be an oppressive structure, uh, uh, its, its opposites, and, and, and then use those and, and deploy those. And of course, if, and, and you know, uh, people, are weird, institutions are weird, and if, if you understand the weirdness, then you can actually, using the, using the institution's own resources, uh, turn the institution against itself. Of, of course, eventually, that will be institutionalized. So it's not that there is, as it were, a straight institution which is repressing um, a kind of weirdness that you can then pull out. The weirdness is what produced the institution in the first place. That is to say, the same way that the solid wall is produced by anxiety 
it, it appears to be the defense uh, 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 in, in that sense. So I think in terms of education, it is, a it is, it is literally um, um, the places that seem least likely to offer uh, subversion that are the greatest potentials. And I think that's what's so interesting is that architecture is, for most societies, the representation of the suppression of danger. So architecture's representational function is to be stable, well-ordered, harmonious, and so on. So actually, in the field of architecture, what's so exciting is that in theory, it's, a, it's even more subversive trick to have the stable figure of a solid building actually liberate, um, uh, open, connect, uh, divert, and subvert. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly why we have in our field uh, I mean, either you are a masochist before you join a school of architecture or we train you how to be one at school. But the kind of personal martyrdom felt by each and every architect across the planet as they feel that no one is listening, but they knew that from the beginning. So you have this incredible, you have, you have one million students are finished. One mil I, I can spend more than five minutes on the answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> There are more than one million students of architecture in the world at any one time. That's what used to be considered the size of a medium-sized industrial city, an incredible firepower. Almost all of those one million people believe that they will never be listened to in their entire life. And they go into the field knowing that, and they martyr themselves to the possibility, the potential that architecture can elevate social ambition. I think that's an amazing, romantic, and ultimately subversive capacity. Uh, something like what we used to associate with the figure of the artist. I think architects are much more fully uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, caretakers of real social ambition, uh, uh, the ambition that we could live in a better world. Tadi Good. Tatiana, um, next question for you. And I'm, I'm sure that all the questions and the answers will, will interweave and interconnect. You just called your presentation Shaking Up Alberti, no? Fittingly also in this critical context, referring to the need for future architectural education to arouse and galvanize traditional and overcome canons and status quo. Interesting enough for me, enough you thereby bring into play one of the most versatile Renaissance polymaths, uh, namely Alberti, like the, the classical universal man, um, whose interest in architecture was just one out of many, no? He was an artist, a poet, a linguist, and a philosopher, a cryptographer, an astronomer, a geographer a broad di diversity that kind of we connect to this man. Could you elaborate now against this backdrop and how far today's architectural education needs to free itself from the shackles of historicism and confidently step into the future without losing its house historic foundation on the way? Um, okay. um, of course, do I have to switch this on? I don't know. Is it on? Yeah. 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 So, sounds good, yeah. Okay. Um, of course, you know, this is also a provocation yeah, to, to say here, um, I want to shake up Alberti. Because mm. of Closer. course, sorry? No. Closer, okay. Um, it's a provocation as well. I, I think more than anything, because um, we tend to be so comfortable in our positions, in our um, lamentation of things, in our... Um, um, acceptance of, um, of something that you might call status quo. So um, in a sense, um, I, I don't know, I, I really don't know how to answer this, <laughs> your question. It's, um, are, you, are you asking um, how it could be taken, how this could be taken forward positively or how yeah, it's... My, my question is, and that's the question that we are facing here with uh, the architecture education, how can we, the same question I basically asked Mark, how can we deal with past, present and future? Yours was very like revolutionary in the statement, shaking up Alberti, this guy is, is, has been quite a mind, quite a yeah. brain. So don't we sometimes fall short just by criticizing? But where, where is the, it's, a, it's a very tricky um, question of equi equilibrium and, and balance that we have to find, I suppose. Yeah, of, of course, but um, in a sense, um, that's our, our challenge as architects, as educators, as, as, as human beings to make these kind of judgments, what is important. I think it's always important to know history. It's always important to, to know what's before, and, and only if you know history can you actually move, m move forward. Um, now, um, <laughs> sorry. No, I, I, I don't I want really to bring you into an un uncomfortable position, no, I'm, I'm but maybe, maybe, um, maybe I can um, ask you a question, Eugene. Yeah. 
in, in that uh, context also of like, what is a school about, what is education about. In an interview uh, that I read, you said that it's now, and I quote here, very difficult and risky to create a school with a very clear, articulated program. In, in the, you said, in the multidimensional cultural space in which we live, you said, any radical ideology expressed is doomed to a very short life. My question to you now is, how do you credibly position yourself as a school and in particular against the birth of three new architecture schools uh, in Moscow alone in the last couple of years. additional question this one you also uh, referenced in your statement about the school often the uh, humanist values of the architecture C could you very briefly elaborate on this one well I think that uh, I think that it's a general problem but in Russia right, right now it's maybe the most important question because the, this, it's very you know the word humanism and human rights and all these things are very much uh, um, how to say it, uh, over, overused so mm -hmm. that's a little bit Nobody knows what does it mean, but in, in this country, in, in Russia, uh, it's, uh, it's particularly important because um, in architecture, in, in the construction business, uh, in urban planning, nobody think of it in, gen in general. So, because um, you know, the Russian capitalism is a very specific thing. I don't know. Do you know everybody what happens? Probably you know about Russian oligarchs and so on and so on. So it's very specific kind of capitalism in which um, people doesn't exist at all. So development is something which, which is done only, uh, only uh, for um, income or, or, or for, for some uh, extra, uh, extra money for <coughs> oligarchs and developers. So nobody think about what, what, is, what is really made for people. So we have not the idea of social housing. We have not idea of socially oriented cities. So that's a very dramatic situation. And in this condition, just the very idea to, to think on, on human level, to, to discuss it on, 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 in terms of humanistic idea, ideas, I think that it's very important. That's, what, that's the point in our school. Mm, thank you. Um, Jono, um, you're faced with a complete different set of factors in Johannesburg. Uh, however, both you and, and Eugene deliberately stressed this humanist or humanitarian aspect in architecture. In your attempt to find a scale of developing solutions through critical engagement on a community level, um, 
that reflects humanist values in its approach and output. How do you cope with the status quo in architectural education and how are you able to balance this, this friction or this tension between the academic curriculum on the one hand side and the one-on-one -on -one work in the field? Um, I think I quite like what Mark was saying about that fear and the guilt. And I think as a South African narrative, it's a big thing. Um, we have this huge, you know, oppressive past, and everyone had a various role in it, whether you were uh, born in it or not born in it. And I think as, as architects, and it's something that I picked up during my, my postgraduate, was that the people who were critiquing and the people who were looking for advice, they, they responded very um, emotionally to the, the sort of work that, that we had done before and that we were tackling with, um, tackling. And I think, this, this is because we, we, we're not really sure about where we really fit in and we, we don't, we're almost scared to have opinions, I think, because uh, we just, I don't know, we, we're kind of so fresh still out of this, out of this, uh, this um, really bad past. And the things that have come through are not just uh, soft, sort of intangible things, but there's so many hard things that, I mean, uh, special things that we also don't, we don't really know how to accept as well. And that, in, in a way, almost through um, uh, apathy, don't expose you to certain things, they don't even let you know about certain things. You grow up in areas that were planned to, to keep you away from other areas that you never even drive through them. So as, as architects, it's just one way to engage these spaces and to be in it, in a kind of in a neutral way, that's a, <laughs> that's a nice word, word to use, because you're there to just offer what support you can. And then while you, or the students I've seen, and, and it was the same for myself and my colleagues in the first instance, was that while you're there, you at least have this as a sort of a shield mm. to engage. That you're not just there as out of guilt, you're there in a sort of mutually beneficial sort of format. And I think this has helped us to be in these spaces. But I, I don't know, this is just my, my, my feeling, and I've, I've shifted it from a few schools. I, I'm from Durban, I lived in Johannesburg, I worked in Cape Town, I studied in Pretoria, and now I'm back in Johannesburg. And what, what I have seen in the different schools is that the schools are so, in a way, scared to shift as well. And it's different than every school, and it's different where I am now. But what it, it seems that it's it's based on the people very high up, who, who um, I think are, are sort of um, stuck in this dialogue themselves. And people are scared to to pass on a degree that people can't use. People pay a lot of money for a degree, so I think in the fear then they don't want to push the boundaries of what is considered architecture, and to go into these other spaces and to start teaching students how to not just be these designers, design these stable buildings, like you said and to start to lose a bit of their control as designers and as uh, people who have problem solvers, they, they, they don't know where to, to put this. So we have to step outside of university and the work that I showed you now, the one-to-one -one student builds, they're completely outside of the curriculum, they're by the students, they're for the students, they do it themselves with the community mm -hmm. under the guidance of the NGO. And only in these spaces can they just be people first and then designers if, if the need calls for it. So I think these are kind of the things that we are we're working mm -hmm. with and it's, it's been very interesting so far. Thank you. Maybe it's also ultimately the strength of any appropriate education, whether architectural or not, um, to actually have the ability to actually allow the cracks and the ruptures and the, the contrast and the contradictions between past, present and future to coexist. No? And maybe this friction actually creates some kind of energy, um, I suppose. However, to, see, to me, it seems that education needs, and you mentioned this before as well, it's always like a becoming, so to speak, needs to remain in a state of, of flux, of uh, movement, of transformation, while thereby always and continuously questioning itself. Um, in, in particular, in the spatial discourse, um, um, at least since Lefebvre, we understand that space is not static. It's not a, it's not a given, but it's a, it's a continuous production of spatial relations. Um, However, as mentioned in the introduction, one of the major disadvantages, so it seems, um, that conventional architectural educational institutions, such as extra-large universities, have is their inherent tardiness or inflexibility. Um, so we have any large structure or system moves move slowly, um, not even to mention like the inner politics and the trench warfares that have also a paralyzing effect on education within a university. Or if I was thinking while the presentations were given before, only if you look at the terminology of education, we speak of a chair as connected to appointment as a, as a professor. That's the most uh, motionless term that we could find for that. No? There's, there's, if no man is omen, we are, we, are, we are in a bad spot right now. No? Um, so um, I was thinking of the great picture that you were showing. We had these 
was called Ars, and a, and a student who was um, like mass uh, um, giving education into the mouse in a very violent way, or sitting on a chair. But um, let's not be too bold here. The slow pace of the institutions also brings along a rightly needed value of stability in education. Um, now a question to all four of you. Can an institutionalized educational giant, like a large-scale university, s swiftly enough respond in their curriculum and their teaching methods to acute demands, whether they're, again, as I said before, architectural, political, or uh, um, philosophical, environmental? And this, the question connected to this one is, what role do alternative, independent, and maybe even mobile educational platforms or formats have here opposed to traditional institutions? Whoever grabs the mics first. No, I think it was a really beautiful question, and I, I love your point about the chair, because the, the chair, as you know, I mean, universities um, don't belong to a place. They are of the world of ideas. So precisely, universities were the professors. And they were mobile. Uh, and the chair is exactly what you receive when you get your degree. So your chair, you are supposed to exactly sit down after giving a lecture. So the sign that you have defended your thesis, your series of theses in, in you know, 11th, 12th century is that uh, you are asked to make a lecture because you have become a teacher. That's why we still refer to a master of architecture. You've become a teacher and you sit in a chair. <laughs> so it's exactly right what you say that the combination of education is a kind of immobility. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at odds with the, with the logic of the of, of the university. Now, the research university, of course, is the university you devoted. Have to bring the microphone. Is the university de yes. de devoted yes. to the product? But it may be better if you don't hear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if the research, uh, okay, the research university is about the production of new knowledge, of course. And, and to, to try to answer your question more precisely, uh, universities are not uh, not evolving as at the same speed as cities. So schools of architecture inside universities are losing their ability to think intelligently about cities. So I think there will be a revolution in the, in the organization of architecture schools, also a revolution in the organization of universities, and I think we have no reason to assume that there will be universities 100 years from now. Uh, university ha has a relationship to the world something like the newspaper used to have. So it will remain honorable, venerable, um, and I I I irrelevant. But if you, look at, if, you, if you look at universities, they are secretly changing enormously. And this is a little bit where I would disagree with the, with the image. If, if you were to make a drawing of architectural education, like an architect's drawing, where you locate everybody, what they're doing, and so on, even if you make a drawing of what you have heard today, you would be drawing something that's as complicated as any city you've ever seen. Very elaborate combination of labs. We had the subcontinent came up about four times already, different labs, different organizations. We heard about labs, symposia, units, cross-disciplinary, that. You're talking about an incredibly agile and intelligent network that has actually grown up and feeds on very traditional resources like major research universities. And what, what will probably happen is that this new form of ar architectural education that has been invented by m and, uh, and is operated by many of the people in this room will become, as it were, the school. And, and universities will become like kind of husks. You know, they will just sort of hang there. Uh, and then eventually the university will be colonized like the industrial part of any city will be then taken over by a new radical, rebellious, group of people totally angry with all these labs and uh, all of these cross-disciplinary collaborations which no longer allow us to think about the essential quality of the... So there'll be this kind of inversion where old university buildings, which will buy, be at that point very cheap, will be taken over by the young generation. I think this kind of ecology, we are al already there. And uh, the language I've been using with you is a very physical language, but we don't live in a physical world. We live in a world of radiation much, much more than we live in... Uh, uh, in the physical world. So I, I think the university you're calling for, it, it actually already uh, uh, exists. And the final point here would be, it's really, really boring that uh, the profession has met for, ever since the profession began, it said that nobody loved it. Ever since architecture school started, they said nobody listens. Uh, it's, it's like a, a declaration of crisis is a kind of, it's actually a form of arrogance. Uh, and, uh, and ongoing. So I don't think architecture education is in any uh, dangerous situation right now. I think it's a absolutely a very, very 
beautiful and, 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 and agile uh, instrument for sheltering doubt. And, and why would it have to shelter doubt? Because we could define the architect simply as that person in society that doesn't know what a building is. So we are the people who have the most doubt about buildings. In the same way a painter is somebody who doesn't know what painting is, so they spend, she spends her whole life painting to try to understand why she loves this thing called painting. Architects do architecture in order to try to understand why it is. So we are the people who know the least about uh, uh, what a building is, and the building for our society represents confidence. So you have maximum doubt located in the representation of maximum confidence. I think what's happening right now is actually engaging with this bizarre psychodrama of, of maximum doubt engaging with images of maximum confidence in a very, very uh, beautiful way. But I also can testify that what Eugene, Eugene said about Marquis uh, is true. Uh, so, so to create a new incubator, 25 years of experiment on the inside of, a, of one of the biggest and most, actually has a longer history than any institution that's been referred to here. From the inside of that school, he launches the experiment out. Marquis probably claims that they gave birth to Eugene, right? That they invented him. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, they did. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the, the three of you also would like to. Well, I, I'd like to add something. You know, first, um, first of all, uh, uh, so uh, I absolutely agree with what Mark said just, just now. and. Um, uh, there are two, two, two ideas which I'd like to, to express. First, that uh, big, big schools, it's like uh, repertory theaters. It's kind of, there are something similar between uh, big theaters and big schools. And there are always conflicts in, in big theaters. They are very, you know, because the actors which are uh, growing up in this theater and they pretend to play Ophelia when she was already uh, 98. Uh, so that's that's something which happens in the in the big schools uh, also. That's a, that's a, it's you know that's a self reproduction system. That's I think that's the big problem with big big institutions. And but the second important thing is that um, what we met just we faced with that, uh, faced this um, as a new school. First of all, people are going to school for to get profession and for to be sure that after they get diploma, they they will earn money with this profession. So that's we can we can discuss everything. You know, how much we must you know uh, all this interdisciplinary and all these things. But finally, a uh, person with diploma must be sure that next day he will start his business and he will earn some money and he will feed his family and so on. So we, we, we must think of this part of education also. And big schools are, have, have much more uh, uh, preferences in these terms. So uh, it, it's, it's, for me, much more complicated to, to recruit students uh, because we are, we are nobody yet. Uh, so maybe next year they will come and, uh, you know, more enthusiastically to, to join my school. But be, but now they prefer to go to Marchi with all this uh, obsolete program, but they, they are sure that they will get education. So that's, I think, also an important part in, for big institutions. It's something, renomé, what, let's say. That, yeah. That's it. Tatiana and Jono, I'm sure you have a slightly different position on this one, too. Um, yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm a little bit uncomfortable with um, this everything and anything goes. Um, position that um, it doesn't really come uh, strongly across, but um, I think as a teacher, I have um, I have a very I have an, an ethical responsibility. I have a set of values, and uh, this might be wrong too for me to teach these values or to convey these values. Teaching is the wrong word, but I think as a teacher, um, as an educator, there's a certain responsibility um, to go beyond merely economical concerns uh, when, uh, when teaching a certain subject. So um, for me, um, um, I think for too long, in a sense, architecture has, has been, um, uh, I don't know, again, a container for everything and anything. And what I'm looking for with architectural education, I guess, is, is for us to take a stronger um, position to what um, architecture is actually good for and um, whom it serves and I've been talking about that. And I would um, 
I would um, see the institutions actually as a perfect place to, um, to implement this kind of uh, thinking. There's um, very big issues at stake and um, uh, I think there's a responsibility for us, not just as teachers or pedagogues, but as um, citizens um, to act on, on certain um, aspects of, of world concern. So um, for me, the education, the, the institution is, is actually a bit of a, an empty container that can be filled with, with a certain kind of meaning. Modules uh, are containers that can be filled uh, with um, certain agendas. Um, and um, um, I, I guess the, the thing I'd like to add here is that, um, um, yes, all, all of this is fine, but um, I would really just want to add strongly that um, uh, architecture is in a bit of a uh, cul-de-sac, in a bit of a, uh, yeah, um, I don't know, too much concern with um, glossy stuff, I guess, and, and form, and um, that a, uh, quite radical rethinking of, of how that is done is, is necessary, but it can take place in the traditional institutions. They have to be filled with different meaning. Sure. Um, I obviously, I'm much uh, less experienced uh, in the education uh, department as my fellow panelists here, but from the experience I have had at the University of Johannesburg, which is a fairly new school that was a merger of a bunch of different schools across uh, Gauteng and Johannesburg, um, I've been watching uh, in the department how they have recently been accredited mm -hmm. with their new master's degree and the process they had to go through. But what is most interesting to me is that the decisions behind the degree course that they have they offer now and who makes these decisions, it's not clear where they come from. It's not the accredited bodies in South Africa, it's not the institu institutes of architects, but somewhere up in the faculty and it's, it appears to be more about marketing and about selling a degree of architecture as a commodity to tell students, like we're talking now about, if you finish this degree, you have a diploma, it'll give you this job, you can pay back your degree and you can continue being a member of society. So the people who, who sell architecture are not architects, they're people in a university faculty or in a, a marketing board, and that's not what they teach in the school, or it's not clearly what they teach in the school. So this is something that I've, I've seen in my, my brief experience, and even as a student, I, I wasn't fully aware of what architecture was until about halfway through my degree. I kind of had this idea, but you also learn. So I think it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and in our, our culture in South Africa, people don't do postgraduate studies. It's you do your undergraduate and then you finish, you get your job and you leave. So to, to keep perpetuating the, um, the kind of uh, niche aspects of architecture that postgraduate uh, offers and to get people to, to then um, be effective in certain um, effective, uh, aspects of architecture, especially for South Africa that has this massive housing problem, it's, it's, it's very tricky, and the people that are, are in charge of it are not clear, and, and they're not sort of in consensus either. So I'm, I just have more questions. I don't really have any, mm. any answers on this. But I mean, maybe one of the questions that we're trying to kind of circle around and not really answer is really what, however, can be learned from alternative educational formats, let's call it, not platforms, no? Um, that are appearing more and more. And, um, and it doesn't, maybe it's not the David versus Goliath thing, you know, but maybe, maybe, maybe even that, that then one's question, what can the Goliaths learn from David? But um, to kind of um, pick up the, the, the metaphors here and the institutions, maybe we continue our march through the institutions together um, and look at also at the revival of more and more, um, let's say, bottom up approaches. It's a very hype term in the last couple of years. Uh, or the re yeah, revival of such, and, and the ideas of the, the collective and the collaborative various subjects that have been touched earlier on before. Um, questions from the audience, uh, we, we enjoy all together a little bit later. Um, but, um, and, and also if you think about the term the march to the institutions, institutions was the, like a, basically connected to the 1960s student movement. We're back again at your uh, um, uh, lecture early in the morning, Beatrice. A, an attempt to create a radical change from within by kind of becoming part of the machinery. Um, and um, we heard before there's plenty of room at the bottom. Um, this was a quote from Feynman by um, uh, Schaffner. So um, where I'm trying to get at, again here, I'm acting as the agent provocateur no, who tries to get something out of you. Um, to me, it looks as if today the unlimited worship, uh, worship and admiration of the, by the way, all too often once revolutionary and now happily or actually uncannily saturated uh, one-man show architect seems to be rapidly decreasing amongst the young generation of becoming architects. So um, Eric, you called it in your little synopsis of your talk today, the authoritative premises. 
and uh, Yoshi called it the hypothesis of optimization of individu individualism is dramatically losing its attraction. Um, and its old glamour is fading out drastically. So does the unrestricted phase in high-priced, extra-large, institutionalized education? Um, so in both cases, I'm looking at the one-man show architect or the star architect and the big institution, um, a peculiar kind of comfortableness in one's own approach, um, method, and ideology seems to prevail that does not necessarily foster an intellectual environment in which a new generation of, let's say, critically aware practitioners and theorists um, within the discipline of architecture emerge. So what is la lacking, um, as pointed out earlier, is this radical pedagogy shake, no? as you might call it, uh, a challenge of, of normative thinking that already played quite a crucial role in, in the architectural discourse and practice in the second half of the 20th century. So wh what happened? is uh, my main question, what happened here? Um, and I would like to maybe divide my packages into generational questions. You already sit perfectly. First you, uh, <laughs> uh, first you Mark, and, uh, and Eugene, all of the aforementioned, <laughs> all, all of the aforementioned criticism and doubt and the prevailing modus operandi and uh, also uh, were very, very key questions uh, right through the 1960s up until the 1970s. Uh, in the architectural education and led to many, uh, let's say, to the development of many countercultural ideas and positions. And that's in both East and West despite the cultural differences and political differences. So what is left of these ruptures, these pedagogical ruptures? Uh, are the shockwaves still tangible, still be felt? And, and how far did the discourse change over the years from your perspective? Well, a couple of things. I, I mean, first, a sort of disclaimer, right? We, we would not necessarily we would not necessarily know how to answer your question, which again was very beautifully asked. In other words, mm. people in the middle of architectural education today may have absolutely no idea what is the significance of their actions. In fact, it would seem like the people least likely to know what the meaning of architectural education today are exactly the group of people invited to this conference, mm. right? So. We can give you our respective logos and promotional and our aspirations and our dreams, but we actually can't give you the deep strategic consequences of our, of our actions. What does it mean for a group of architects to get together and declare that it's absolutely crucial to collaborate with other disciplines in a conference of only our discipline? Mm. Right? So, so, we, so, so this is, let, let's say, just part of the problem that, that we are actors. Then, then, then there is the kind of McLuhan argument that each, two, each new technology is only visible when it's replaced by the next one. In other words, and this is a little bit what I meant before, I, I agree totally with Beatrice's conclusion mm -hmm. that, that nothing is happening in schools today that gets anywhere near the radicality mm -hmm. of the transformations that were experimented with in the 60s and 70s. I, I completely agree with that. And you could argue that a lot of what we've heard about today are kind of uh, glossy versions of strategic tactics that were launched at that time. We might even be able to show one by one that there's a clear precedent for every exciting, interesting, transgenerational, whatever thing that went on. But I have the sense that there has emerged another idea about education which no longer, and it's what I tried to say in my five minutes, is no longer with such a clear dis distinction between the world of education and the world of practice. And it goes exactly to your question of sharing because the generation of, of today uh, is incredibly exciting because they don't feel any discomfort about being personally beautiful, uh, beautiful financially, uh, ethically responsible, technically advanced. They don't see an interest in sustainability as being, as it was in my generation, a, an excuse for the ugliness of your work. They genuinely think that all of those things can, if knowledge is shared, be handled. Uh, so compromise is simply not a category uh, very, very strongly held by students today. And I think, to some extent, teachers are starting to learn from their students about this and are able to offer some things back. There are some things about classic studio culture, which is about sharing, but it ha in the past has been sharing with the idea of producing unique individual geniuses at the end, but actually the students no longer, no longer want that last phase. So I think you have now a much more horizontal uh, mechanism whereby education is not something simply in the schools, it's also in the blogs, also in the way people exchange. It's also in the, just to maybe conclude with an example, 
in the kind of bank robbery type style of practice, which is to say there's a competition, somebody emails a friend who's very good with curtain walls, said, do you want to enter this competition with me? And they put together a team of six or seven people around the world with very different skills who happen to be free for three months so they can go rob the bank, which means win the competition. If they win the competition, they then have to call themselves an office. So they have to invent a name for themselves. This, this mode of practice, which depends on the ability to use shared again, that word comes up, software platforms and so on, represents a, 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 an incredibly deep transformation of the way in which the architect is positioned in society. I know of no school that is really adequate to that model. That, that, that model is way beyond the capacity of even the most interesting school to operate. And yet that model, couldn't we think of it as a new kind of school? And I think that's what happened, is that the, is that the world of education has, drif <coughs> has drifted outside of the visible solid walls of institutions into a much more complex uh, horizontal domain. And that domain has extraordinary capacity and is doing a huge amount of good in the world. And I think uh, we should be uh, very proud of the fact that our students are so much more interesting than we are. We are. And your questions are the perfect example. I understood I speak first in the, in the wheelchair end of the, um, <laughs> of the, of the table. So I, I, I hand over to my fellow geriat ger geriatric uh, uh, Eugene. I mean, we're so old, we can't even play the wisdom card anymore. We're more into the sort of senility mode. <laughs> It's very beautiful. You must, you must make something absolutely, absolutely like this. And it was the training. In a way, it was, it was positive because we had not, nothing in front of us. It, it was, you know, a kind of, um, a kind of real training. But now it sounds stupid. So to, to show to students what what our colleagues are doing in in the United States, for example. So, and in this case, we have no teachers in, in, in the country trained in, in, in the proper way. So the, uh, the teacher always think of what, the problem of teacher is what to translate. You know, what is the, what is, because teacher is mechanism of translation of some knowledge or some, something to, to the next generation. And right now it's the biggest, biggest question, what to translate, what should I as a teacher, translate to the next generation. What is my obligation before them? So, uh, is it? Am I just a moderator, as you said? You know, something. You know, something in the air, and you just concentrate this, and you can show the. You know, to ma magic paths, and and to say this is this is something you must get from me. What what is the role of the, of the teacher? Uh, what is what is the matter of translation? I think that is the most intriguing and most interesting in the whole this discussion. What we as a teacher, what is our uh, matter of 
and what, what we are presenting to students. That's, that's the question I think that's, um, which is very important for, for me as the dean of the new school, what we're giving to our students. Um, yeah, I, I still wonder like how this, the recurrence of these issues I mentioned before, like are they a welcome deja vu or not in that sense uh, for you guys? But now um, to you, Tatiana and, and Jono, both of you may be described as, as prime examples of a young generation of architects who understand that it's necessary for the education of architecture to respond uh, or reposition the discipline in a wider social, social political context. Um, and grasp, ar grasp architecture's responsibility within a collective coexistence. Um, now I'm wondering how, how far do you see yourself in the tradition of your prehistoric um, comrade in arms, um, or um, which historic predecessors do you regard as, as inf influential um, or in yeah, motivational references? <laughs> um, I think you know, you know there's a, that axiom: uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And when we started one to one, we thought we were completely revolutionary. And then the more people we spoke to in South Africa to get advice on our manifesto, and that more it had been done so many times before. But perhaps in the, the sort of um, sharing of it or the marketing of it, it wasn't seen as that because it was in a time of revolution. Whereas now we, in South Africa, we're in a time of sort of re, re rebuilding or re regeneration. But um, I think the, the, those, those lessons that are there and, and those things, are, they're, they're very valuable. But the way that we share information, as Mark was pointing out, has completely changed. I mean, it's, it's obvious. The, the way that we can uh, access stuff across the world, I mean, this feeling of being stuck on a different part of the globe. As, as, as um, South Africans, we always feel like everything better is happening in Europe and North America and South America and India. And, but that we can access it, we can share it. I mean, uh, the website that uh, Tatiana Special Agency has has got an amazing database of of these practices, and just through something as simple as that, we can feel connected to all, all of this. So, I mean, that, that's obviously completely different, and it made yeah. us much more aware of, of how to position ourselves and how to be more effective in, the, in this kind of global discussion of what we're trying to do. I don't think we have any illusions that we are completely revolutionary. Um, and I think this, this challenge of like, how schools can, um, I don't know, perpetuate these like, kind of collaborations, it's, it's, it's completely tricky in that I mean, how do, you, how do you own something that is shared across the world? And then how do you get people to buy into that and then, and then um, pay for that sort of education? We're saying, we will teach you this, but you're actually gonna get it from all of them. And then people, students won't, won't be there. This kind of control and ownership of a design is something that we come up a lot with in our work. But I think it's the same in the schools that we, you, you kind of can't let go of things. You have to hold on to them. In, in the NGO sector, we see it all the time, where people sort of uh, hold on to the positive effects of anyone's situation. You know, these are our poor people, you didn't help them, we helped you, because the funding lines are completely tied to that, mm. to, to try and talk about impact. And I imagine in schools, from what I've seen, it's, it's the same thing. You talk about the research, it's my research. I did it, therefore I can apply for these fundings and these grants. So I think that, that model is stuck. And I mean, I, I don't know how, how it's gonna be undone, then the school might be undone as well. But yeah, it's, again, it's something that I'm also very interested in. So explicitly about um, references to Heroes and <laughs> um, there's, I think there's a there's a whole range of people that have been very important for me and um, one um, certainly was um, one of my my teachers, uh, Johnson Charlie, who introduced me to the <laughs> idea um, that architecture actually is political. Mm -hmm. um, it's it seems so obvious to state now, but um, it was quite revolutionary when um, when he first mentioned it. Um, it's, it's not very, that we're all so familiar with Lefebvre that, you know, entering, um, um, Lefebvre's entering into the discourse of architecture is a relatively recent phenomenon, I'd say, you know, it's, it's probably not, um, it certainly wasn't common when I studied architecture to, to talk about um, um, space as, um, as, um, as um, socially created. Uh, so, um, for me, um, Still, um, there's there's a very long tradition. Uh, Beatrice uh, Colomina mentioned quite a quite a lot of my um, um, the people I, I refer to um, Giancarlo De Carlo for various reasons, um, but but also um, um, 
uh, <laughs> if we go further back um, to a certain degree, um, Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, as you might have reckoned, <laughs> because um, uh, they, um, I guess, um, made statements about the production of space that um, still hold true and um, still need to be challenged. Um, I, I, I hate to state all these male heroes um, of mine, and I've been thinking frantically about um, uh, women as well, which um, I guess um, is, is, is something that we, that I, um, <laughs> yeah, that um, we tend to forget that um, a lot of um, uh, the production is um, um, is actually made in a in a much quieter way. So. Um, um, Gardening for me is a, is a uh, urban gardening is a very um, um, big um, um, influence for me, especially um, in Vienna in the 1920s. More social movements that um, um, yeah influenced um, this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. These kind of traditions I think are important to to talk about in architecture. So um, different kinds of histories other than the ones. Not which I'm very thankful for the reply now, leads kind of to the next cluster uh, of questions, that's namely the intersectional possibilities of, of architecture that there are. Um, and I was, that's on a side note only, both mentioned the media and you brought the McLuhan's kind of question into the space. Maybe this is a point that the, the, the easy access to information and reachability and involvement via new media such as you know, social media, etc. sometimes, um, and I'm reflecting about upon, upon the ideas that have been um, kind of established first and presented 40 years ago. Maybe now the media is right um, for the ideas that have been presented 40 years ago and make them more relevant or give them a different value at this stage. But that's a, that's a side note that we can discuss uh, in, in a one-to-one -one discussion. Um, I would like to reflect upon the transdisciplinary, we also hype term, the capacities of architecture and thereby very discreetly, Martha introduced or slow fade into the topic of the second. It's I'm touching it slightly. Panel today, namely the interdisciplinary strategies. Um, you once appropriately said, uh, Mark, that there's no subject um, an architect won't talk about, um, and you said uh, the sort of restless uh, promiscuity is entirely positive and. Uh, Matthias Klotz, no, he didn't say anything today, but he wrote in his little <laughs> synopsis that there is an intersectional complexity of the uh, professional work of the architect. And Stachaya uh, remarked earlier that the conventional form of architectural practice has only marginally touched the large challenges we face today. So all these observations are true and valid. And I think the architect has to f kind of think outside of the box. Uh, and, uh, and architecture indeed shows an impressive flexibility. Um, as a partner for very different disciplines. So actually I know only of a very few disciplines that can actually connect to so broad a range of other disciplines as architecture is capable of, whether it's from a technolo technological or technical or engineering perspective, from a social, political or historical angle, a poetic, artistic, scientific point of view, both theory and practice, um, all the connection points or the multiple points of context are, are possible. And I think these partnerships broadens also the, the, the definition of architecture. And here I believe alternative architecture education formats and ideas could offer unseen opportunities to curious bystanders almost, or non-architects that could potentially enrich the architectural discussion and the, let's say, overall spatial and cultural reflexivity of the profession. Would you agree to this? And um, what, what role do you really give, I mean, we've always kind of m maneuvered around these alternative formats. What I'm speaking of is small uh, educational um, formats that are outside of the university, where you don't get a degree at the end, but people are nonetheless coming. There are workshops, there are schools where people are teaching themselves, basically. Um, and, and there the mixture of disciplines is, is much higher than, as you said here, for example. We're talking as architects, or actually I'm not an architect, to, to architects. Well, people, people are getting older faster um, across the planet, but particularly now Africa leads, leads the way in this, in this change. Um, so if, if, if the most obvious question, I, I mean, I think I can get to an answer. The most obvious qu question facing our field is that 7 billion people will be living in cities by 2050, and absolutely nobody has any idea what that means. 
even less do we know what it means that two, two billion of those people will be over the age of 60. So that, that requires an entirely different concept. And one, one of the changes that's almost for sure is that the old model of kind of childhood, then education, then work, then retirement, then death, uh, will completely change and education will be absolutely continuous for, the, for your 100 years. In, in such an environment, it will be very close to, to what you're describing. I, I, I think when, when the way it can be an answer to the question is that I don't think interdisciplinary means the relationship between architecture and other disciplines. There actually, in a, in a sense, is no discipline of architecture. Architecture, even as a word and as a ca category, in the hands of uh, Vitruvius, he says precisely, you need, architect knows a little bit about everything, but not a lot about anyone. And that's when the naivety comes in, is the architect has a singular skill, which is to com combine incompatible forms of information. And anybody who really knew what they were talking about wouldn't do it, couldn't do it. So the architect, courageously or naively, enters a space of very complex uh, information needs and so on, and creates a possible form of organization that allows that complexity to, con to, con to continue. That is a remarkable gift, but that is also an urgently politically necessary gift when answer trying to answer the question, what the hell do we do with everybody living in cities at such a scale, such a density, limited resources, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is a kind of, um, the, the sort of, at the very heart of the figure of the architect for all of our criticisms, is a kind of multi-dimensional multi synthetic capacity which depends on a sort of ignorance of the architect. So if schools of architecture are about making people less ignorant, we may be like heading down the wrong path. And if schools of architecture cultivate the mythology of a magic core to the discipline, which is exactly what produces these male heroes that whose egos then stand in the place of the fact that none of us know what this core is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if one sort of undermines that a little bit and just say, actually, the, the, the great gift of the architect is, is an ability to think multidimensionally in incompatible spaces dealing with apparently irreconcilable forces, this becomes uh, extraordinarily uh, a fascinating skill. And the other thing about that skill is it's not so different from the skill a child has today in mixing their world, mix and matching. So in other words, we. We, for the first time, uh, uh, the so-called client, let, that is to say the human species, thinks like architects think. That is to say they think in a multidimensional synthetic way. So for the first time, we as multidimensional synthesizers are communicating with a community that thinks of itself that way, not just the uh, teenage generation, let's say. And that represents, I think, quite a significant change in the structure of the field because architects are communicators. I mean, it's really what architects do is communicate ideas. And you can, if you can do that with a building, great. But even if it were the building, a building in the so-called media. And I think that what we call the media, it, you, you said it very well, I think, already, but what we think of the media, our image of that came from the 60s, right? 64, something like this. Actually, the media world that we live in now, even according to the people that gave us that image, McLuhan, et cetera, will be something different, will only be recognized as such in the future. But I think it's already there, and therefore, the species of the architect has probably gone through an evolution, a kind of quiet evolution of which we are the least interesting symptom. But we're, we are a symptom, even even those of us at this end of the uh, of, of the table. Getting getting back to Tatiana, I think what was great about your speech was uh, it's a real manifesto. Um, it's a manifesto about about the uh, political responsibilities of the figure of the architect. I would like to say I think that most of our students wouldn't, would, would, wouldn't have disagreed with, with a word of what you said and would have felt themselves to be, as it were, students of your program, even though you didn't meet them. And I think that's what's interesting. You have a generation for which this is just taken for granted. It's obvious when you make any kind of gesture as an architect that you're in complicity with an enormous, wide-ranging uh, uh, political system, and almost every student has a very specific idea of their own personal politics in relationship to that. That's a big change. And I think that's the contrast with that period of the 60s in which the, that, uh, uh, what was revolutionary was, was that as a statement. That was a call to revolution. Uh, what we have to deal with is the possibility that the revolution already happened. And then the question is, now that the revolutionaries have that capacity through these technologies, will it lead to a better world? And it's not clear yet. 
But repeating the slogans won't get there. It's more like um, if we now trigger this, you know, intentionality and this incredible global capacity that this generation has, which is also simply a technological capacity. There's no difference between how you think, how you communicate, and how you build. Uh, something nice might be happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've got like 20 years uh, to figure this out. Any one of you? Okay. Uh, uh, I'll make two commands concerning your question. Uh, first, that I think that multidisciplinary, it always was, as already Mark mentioned, that it was starting from Vitruvius. And the um, architects shouldn't uh, and cannot uh, replace the professionals in, in, other, in other fields. But I think what is important, uh, and always was important for architect, uh, the uh, possibility to ask proper questions to uh, other professions. And to, 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 to make this, to make clear questions and to, to um, get right um, and proper, proper um, uh, considerations uh, of the, from the answers. That's, I think, the important thing. So I would never su suppose that architect will replace statistics or statistic or some other professional in particular field. But I think it's very important for us uh, to teach students to ask proper questions in multidisciplinary terms. And the other thing is that what I, I suppose still is very important for architect is to have a, a very specific kind of intuition which is based on the very wide uh, field of knowledges uh, or at least some, if not <coughs> deep profound knowledges, but at least some kind of uh, ideas floating in the air about everything. And the proper, good intuition is the ability to, to, to concentrate somehow to get every, all these images inside and to produce something. That's, I think, extremely important. And this is, uh, this is something which no one other profession can do. That's what we must train our students to, to have this intuition and to, to develop it. Thank you. I just got a sign here from the organizers. We have another 10 minutes, I believe. Um, and I would like to open up this discussion to anyone here in the room. Last but not least, coming to an end, you mentioned this before. Um, this is one last question that I'd have for you, and it gives you the opportunity for a kind of a closing statement. Um, that, um, let's say, the, uh, I'm interested in the cognitive surplus of the architectural model. So there's a phenomena that the. the um, we witness kind of a renaissance of very diverse spatial practices and discourses in the arts and various disciplines, and we also at the simultaneously witnessed a spatial or topological turn in the cultural and social studies in recent years. This is a phenomenon that's picking up on old ideas from the 50s or 60s, but it's a paradigm shift that doesn't take space for granted, but regards space as once again culturally constituted and historically speaking completely unsteady. However, um, Architecture against the spectrum seems to act beyond its functional denotation as a really performative and apprehensive model of understanding. So maybe one short statement for all of you. Where do you see the, the epistemological surplus of the architectural model? What can we learn from architecture? And what, what does architecture offer that other models don't offer? That's a tricky one. Yeah, maybe... Um, the younger generation, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or we can take we can take actually this question to open up the debate now in the, in the entire room. Um, you're all architects. This is the question you're all facing in one way or another. Um, and it, I want to also give you the chance, you the chance to interact with the panelist. Eric, I see the first hand up. Oh, sorry. I'm Watching this uh, take place, uh, a couple of things struck me. One is that there are very substantive cultural differences from place to place on the planet. Xu Wei Go is sitting in here. He runs Tsinghua University in Beijing. Is it Eugene? Uh, yeah, we, we talk a little bit about the Mariinsky. It's not clear to me that when he takes a position that he's taking, that he 
gets back into uh, Moscow unscathed either. So the risk quotient of, of certain positions taken in this context are very different for different people than for others. I don't want to say the rest of us are all dilettantes, <laughs> but, they're, but, but, but they're, they're some survival at stake actually in taking certain radical positions that run counter to the state. So just from my point of view, uh, my, my commendations and support, uh, particularly for the voice from Moscow, for attempting to hack into that machine, which has been problematic for lo these many years. Uh, the other thing is that, 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 that a lot of opinions that we heard from architects um, this morning and this afternoon, I think are fairly consistent and fairly predictable. Sanctimonious may not be the word, but they're, they're loaded with virtue and about what the world is and what the world should be and that they think they know what it is and they want to inculcate it. And my it's not to say that they're right or wrong, but my apprehension about that vantage point is, is that you have to be careful you don't become what you think your adversary is already doing. And a different model of, of delivering ideas is to hypothesize a venue where ideas are in tension, actually, between <laughs> possibilities. That there isn't, when somebody says sustainability and everybody genuflects, you know, like, like they used to do in America with these guys that walked around with the flags, which somehow the political, I don't know if that's so known in Europe, but you know, certain characters walked around with a flag which was an indication of your virtue and in particular your patriotism and all of that. So I think that, that there may be an educational model which is a less, a less structured model, one with less perimeter authority, tenure, uh, you belong to my school, you can't go to their school. You know, all of that. The ownership of architecture as it's associated with a particular school, I think, or the vanities of particular school. If, if, if architecture is nominally a single discourse and it, and it resonates wherever it does, so no, you can't come to my school because the contract says I have to say okay. You know, so, so some of what inhibits an open discussion is, is the structure of, of the academy itself that has to be looked at. And the structure of the academy, of course, protects the people who run the academy. So too big to fail doesn't only belong in, in, in certain cases. To, to fiscal institutions. So there might be a discussion, of, there might also be, is that enough, Hans? Oh, yeah, enough? <laughs> oh, did you have? <laughs> okay, thank you. Matthias, also again. I have a short question, and I, I just wonder, aren't we maybe already over this point where we discuss about? Because probably we're not on par with the one million students in the world. Some are probably not doing this, what we talked about today. But I have the feeling in this room, most people are doing it. And in, in where I teach at the moment, for example, we have the problem more that people are all the time somewhere in the world doing build projects somewhere, doing a research there and so on, and they hardly come to the school to learn the classical stuff. I'm not sure if they need to, but, um, but that's my experience at the moment. So it's, and, and, um, and so maybe, I mean, maybe we could look at what would be the, what could be the, in a way it's also our wishes. I have to, I, I think what Tatiana 
proposed is what we all also think. So maybe it's, in a way it's our wishes what we think our students should learn at the moment, and some of them do because they learn what we kind of suggest, but maybe there are already other people that are totally individual and want to build like the male dominated whatever um, houses again, I don't know. That could also happen, so I think it's like a reverse that c could also happen. And I would, what we should do, I think, here is that we should, it's almost like an anthropology, we should think about how our approach to go to people locally and how, like what we talked about this morning about how can we actually do that without being imperialistic or something, but how to engage with local audiences. And, and I think that would be quite interesting to learn from each other and then by that way also <coughs> bringing it further. <coughs> Yeah, I was thinking um, what's really interesting, uh, I don't know, you probably know Samuel Mogby, right, who was in the south of America, who uh, who worked a lot with poor people in rural environments and used recycled materials and stuff. And I was thinking not necessarily to talk about Mogby, but to how as a university, as in a school of architecture, we're often in a large university, in my case in a gigantic <laughs> university, and how we uh, as architecture schools do absolutely usually nothing about that. So it's very easy for us to sit here and to criticize education and to criticize how we are, but going back to Mark's statement, how this whole world is urbanizing in a rapid speed, um, there's economies developing, we have no idea what it's going to be, we see Beijing uh, suffocating itself, um, and you know, in, in a really weird way, I, we, the other day we did at the school uh, a non-trash week. And you know how interesting that is? It's a stupid small thing to do, but non-trash week, and I actually learned it in India. <laughs> when I was in a school, they had a really funky little machine. They had built themselves with some sort of robotics people, and the, they put trash in, and they made energy out of it. And actually, like, one floor was running uh, from the trash and was running energy-free. And I was thinking, you know, we do shit all. We sit in these universities, and I actually asked the, the other day the university president, like, you know, I have someone who can donate solar, solar panels. Can we put them on the roof of the architecture school? And she's like, we've calculated that, you know, that investment really doesn't bring up any money. I said, well, you don't invest because you get them donated. She said, well, we still, you know, our calculation model is really not, a, <laughs> it's not working. But this is really where we as architects also should start to think about that as a, architecture school, we have a big university full of students. And you know, so I had, what was it, 45,000 students? If I could in one year just have these students one week not to produce trash, you know, I, when I did it with my students, it was crazy. The amount of work it takes, the amount of energy it takes, the amount of thinking it takes, the amount of planning it takes, is like totally insane. But it really changed all of us. We produce different, amounts of trash now, you know, the whole school. And it is really amazing because trash is actually one of the biggest urban problems at the moment. And, you know, funny enough, if you go to Copenhagen, uh, Denmark or whatever, they recycle and, re and incinerate, but we, in, in most countries, we dump, right? So I see the signs here very clearly. We have to come to an end. Um, we can continue the discourse or we can take a break from the discourse. There's a panel in an hour coming up. Um, I would really like to thank the panelists, all of you, for joining here and thank the audience for the uh, attention. And maybe we can uh, close with, with uh, Euripides, a famous Greek tragedian, who said, question everything, learn something, answer nothing. Thank you very much.